Okay, so today we're going to talk about Napoleon, the great emperor, and, you know, kind of dodgy on some occasions. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, he really wasn't that short, so now that that's decided, you know, let's move on. All right, so his early life, as you see there on the right, a young Napoleon, you know, growing up in a small town in Nebraska, I think, or not, not really, that's just, you know, funny. Here is our friend, the real Napoleon, who was born in Corsica. Um, and as a young boy growing up was actually very anti-France because he felt that Corsica should be free, but his parents were like, yeah, that's cool, kid, you're going to military school, and at military school, turns out he was really, really good, and he would uh, rise his way through the military um, all the way up through the French Revolution, although for a time he did find himself in jail. Um, after the fall of Maximilien Robespierre, he was one of the guys rounded up as possibly being a supporter of Robespierre, but he was found innocent and released. And he was released back into the army. There's a little bit of a younger General Napoleon, and he is going to rise up and just really go on a fantastic run. He will defeat Prussia on a number of occasions to keep them out of France. He is able to, with the army that he had take over northern Italy for France. Later on, he actually will defeat Egypt as well and is able to bring that into the empire for a little while, although he does take his first defeat at Abukir Bay uh, by the great British Admiral Horatio Nelson, who will cause him problems repeatedly, although for whatever reason, no one really found out about uh, that defeat, and he was seen as this, you know, undefeatable general, and, you know, he helped, uh, uncover the pyramids, and it was during his expedition that we found the Rosetta Stone, so, you know, that was cool. Eventually, he is made the consul of, uh, France, and as we know, uh, the directory was replaced for a consulate for the executive, similar to ancient Rome, and he will lead a coup in the year 1799 to be named Consul for Life, and <clears throat> after that, he's going to have a few more military victories, which are always nice. There will be an assassination attempt on his life, but it fails, and in 1802, he is going to hold an election that names him uh, Consul for Life in a new constitution which is uh, Constitution number four. So in many ways, we can call this the fourth phase of the revolution, I guess. Um, uh, he does have a two-house legislature, but what he ends up getting done is that in 1804, he gets the Senate to name him uh, emperor. They have an election to approve it, which he wins like 99.7% of the vote. And thus you get this picture here. This picture is actually in the Louvre today and it's freakishly gigantic. It's like 20 feet tall and like 20 feet or about like 25 feet wide. It's really insane. And this is him down here after he, uh, gets his crown and then he's actually crowning his wife, the Empress Josephine. And so things are going for well for him. Now, for a little while, he is going to just consolidate his hold on France. He's going to make some treaties with Prussia and some other places to calm down. But then in 1805, he decides he is going to, you know, just beat everybody. Um, and at the battles of Ulm, Jena, Alaou, and the most impressive was the Battle of Austerlitz, he basically just whacks Prussia, Russia, Austria, just everything. Everything is gone. He conquers most of Europe, and then he makes Russia a subject state. And the fact of the matter is his army is better for a variety of reasons. One, he is the best general in the world. His army is faster. He has better tactics. He can almost anticipate when uh, battles are going to go a certain way. So he was fairly awesome. <clears throat> And then to go along with that, his army was huge. I mean, having hundreds of thousands of men, top-notch equipment. I mean, this guy just had everything. And when it was all said and done, this is the empire that we are going to see him have. Now, as you can see, the area that he directly controls, and if you look at the notes, uh, you had his inner core, which was 
uh, the Empire of France, most of what is modern-day Germany, Holland, the Netherlands, and northern Italy. Okay, the light green areas, Spain, Italy, the Confederation of the Rhine, and parts of Poland, those areas are subject states that uh, sometimes his relatives, more often than not his brothers, were actually in charge of. Um, and they would have their, you know, obeisance to him. And then you have... Austria and Prussia were forced to sign agreements that they would obey him as allies. Um, he did have a treaty with Russia, although they really didn't like him. And then Britain, Britain is just going to be a nightmare. And, you know, his quote about Europe, that being Napoleon, is, Europe cannot be at rest except under a single head who will have his kings for officers who will distribute his kingdom to his lieutenants. So he was running the show. Now, what's very interesting is that despite the fact that he was an emperor, and by no means understand that he is an emperor, um, he did a lot of important societal changes in France. Um, one of the big things was equal opportunity for all people. Uh, he takes away special privileges for nobles and the clergy and kind of puts everyone at the same level. Remember, he's a military guy, so he wants to advance people based on merits. Um, he's going to be really big about religious toleration, which we know France has had a variety of issues with. Um, government positions will only go to the most qualified. And probably his biggest influence was the creation of the Code Napoleon or the Napoleonic Code. This was a civil law that applied all laws equally to all people, regardless of their background or class. It included a criminal code. Um, that really got rid of the biased laws that existed before it and made sure that all laws um, were and punishments were applicable to the crimes that were broken. Um, and in many cases, he will then overhaul the legal system to make sure giving people the rights to lawyers, making sure that judges are impartial. And it's weird because you have like this, this clearly dictatorial guy who is developing the themes of democracy and republicanism underneath him. Now, what really made him nuts is Britain, and I call Britain that darn island, and in France, that's Ile Darn. Um, we said that he was already defeated by Horatio Nelson, you see this guy right here, once in Egypt. He then makes one attempt to try to conquer uh, Britain, he has a huge naval force assembled, and they meet off the coast of Trafalgar and the Battle of Trafalgar, in which he is whacked by Horatio Nelson again. Although, sadly, Horatio Nelson does die in this battle. I think he caught a cannonball, and you tend not to walk away from that. Um, so Britain is defeated. So in the end, he decides to... Um, go back home and concentrate on the continent and develop something that was called the Continental System. The idea that he thought he could do was to destroy the British economy. So he made it illegal for anyone in Europe to trade with Britain and really tried to encourage places like the Americas to also not trade with Britain. The problem is, is that Britain has the best navy in the world and Latin America and Asia are completely still open. Remember, the British also kind of invented you know, being a pirate, and so they knew all sorts of ways where they could sneak on to the coast and still sell products, because frankly, the, the British Navy just wasn't any good. And so despite, despite their ideal and Napoleon's job to try to take out one of his enemies, uh, in the end, it just wasn't working. Uh, and then finally, he makes his biggest blunder. Tsar Alexander I was discovered, even though he wrote signed a treaty with Napoleon that he wouldn't do it, he was trading with Britain. So he decides to take out these guys, he being Napoleon, to take out Russia once and for all and just obliterate them. He is going in 1812 to invade Russia with 600,000 men, which is a stupidly high number, and just obliterate them. The Russians are like, okay, Slick, this is what we're going to do. They will engage him on a number of occasions, and thousands of men will die, but they're going to keep withdrawing and withdrawing, and what they do is that they burn everything as they withdraw. So, Napoleon has to expand his supply lines all the way back from France, and you guys are familiar with the map of Europe, knowing that Russia and France are not close to each other. 
the most notable thing that they did is they actually burned down most of the city of Moscow. And then one of the worst recorded winters, we're talking about measuring snow in the realms of 10 to 20 feet, will hit Russia along with some of the coldest sub zero degree temperatures like we're talking like negative 20 before the wind chill and the French army is just obliterated they have to go home and when they return they only have of that 600,000 40,000 men left just a horrible loss of life then the rest of Europe was like, look at how weak they are. And Russia, Prussia, Austria, and Sweden in October of 1813 will attack um, France in the Battle of Leipzig, and Napoleon is defeated. Now, for whatever reason, they don't kill him. I don't really know why, and again, I'm not advocating that, but typically you would think that would happen. Instead, they exile him, and they exile him to the island of Elba. As you can see there, I mean, I... I I would be exiled there right now because it's cold in Jersey. Uh, and then they restore Louis the Eighteenth to the throne. I will get to it. I know we had a democracy. What's going on? Don't worry, we'll get there. Unfortunately, they're evidently not very good at guarding the land because Napoleon is able to sneak back into France. And as soon as he does, the army declares that they are no longer part of uh, or will no longer listen to Louis XVIII, and they are back with Napoleon. And he decides that we need to go back after, and he's going to try to reconquer all of Europe, and then they have this massive battle at the Battle of Waterloo, which is in modern-day Belgium, which most people don't know. On the right here, you see actually a part of the battlefield and the monument for uh, the Battle of Waterloo today. Uh, Napoleon will be faced by his main enemy again, the British, who will be led by Arthur Wellesley, the first Duke of Wellington. He is typically referred to as the Duke of Wellington. And no, it's not Arthur Weasley, of course, the patriarch of the Weasley family in Harry Potter. No, it is Arthur Wellesley, but he's just the Duke of Wellington. Also, fun fact, would later on be a prime minister of of England. What's really interesting, and I don't really have a map up here, but basically what happens is Napoleon had two main armies, okay? His army was going to engage the British, while his other army was going to engage a Prussian force led by General Blücher on its way to battle them. Well, what ends up happening, I know it sounds crazy, but his second army actually gets lost and they don't engage the Prussians. You know, remember, it's the 1800s. We don't have you know, satellite feeds and, and, and stuff like that. And because they didn't get it, as Napoleon is engaged with the British, the Prussians come to his flank and he is crushed. And this time, they make sure to get rid of him. He will be exiled now to the island of St. Helena. And you see here, this was actually the house that he lived in, where he will die not too uh, long in the future of either stomach or pancreatic cancer, pick one. Now, his impact was actually quite huge. What Napoleon actually did is he helped create modern-day Europe. And the reason why he did that is that because he conquered so many people, those people realized the importance of having a strong central belief in them and their country. And he helped form national identities. You know, the Germans will form after this. The Italians will form after this. The Holy Roman Empire finally has just kind of been pieced out for a while, but you get like Austria and Denmark and different types of places like that. So he helps do that. He also fosters the concept of cooperation because after this, the Europeans realize that they cannot allow something like this to happen again, and you'll actually see less wars. There'll be some wars, don't get me wrong, and most of them done by the Germans, but for the most part, Europe becomes a little bit more peaceful, and they tend to go the route of, hey, what if we negotiate and try to avoid conflict that might be a good thing. And the final thing is, despite the fact that here was a guy that was trying to take over the world, and by some people was viewed as actually the Antichrist, um, he helped to create democracy because the Code Napoleon was installed in all of these areas that he controlled, again, really only for a few years. But many of these nations would adopt these codes and these laws um, and you're starting to see the breakdown a little bit of that societal of like the nobles and the non-nobles, and you're starting to get less of a stratification. 
Uh, now here we have the tomb of Napoleon. This giant thing is his, you know, for a guy that was like 5'5". Five, five, I mean, that's a little bit of an overkill, but, you know, very, very impressive. I've been here, go. The final thing that comes out of this is actually the Congress of Vienna, which, after his defeat, met from 1814 to 1815, and it was led by Clements Wenzel von Metternich, another fantastic name, although I still think I like Robespierre more. And their purpose was basically to come together to redraw the map of Europe because they really want to make sure they kind of get everything right here. Um, and they come up with the idea of periodically meeting so that they can help each other with problems and to also prevent crazy revolutions. Because a lot of people felt that it was the French revolutions and the um, really violence and lack of unity within it that led to all of these problems. And so the idea was that to have people come together on a regular basis, in many cases the Congress of Vienna actually proved to be the precursor for like the League of Nations and even the United Nations. But it was a way that they would make sure that one nation would never get too powerful. They also worked on trying to keep um, the current governments in power, whether it was a monarchy or whether it was a constitutional democracy. We're just going to make sure it stays the same. So for those uh, commoners that wanted their own rights, I mean, good luck with that. But in general, it was very, very successful. And all of these things really come from Napoleon. So as you can see, he was a tremendously inf influential individual. And we'll talk about him a lot more in class tomorrow. So make sure you get your questions and comments, and I'll see you then.